When we look at this picture of the September 11th attacks, I'm sure any of us in the, in the room could remember where we were, what we were doing when we heard the news that day. Well, to neuroscientists and psychologists, this is a great example of a flashbulb type memory where you're confronted with a very, very powerful event um, and all of the inconsequential things that you normally wouldn't remember, like where you were, what you were eating, what you were wearing, um, all of those things get caught in the flash, if you will, and come along for the ride. So the question of how the brain achieves uh, these types of uh, associated memories and how it gives you your sense of self-location, that would be the where you were when you heard about the attacks, these have been and continue to be um, very intensive areas of research in neuroscience. But understanding how memory formation happens in the brain is no small task because the brain contains approximately 86 billion neurons. Each of these neurons makes connections with between 1,000 and 10,000 other neurons. This makes for a staggering 100 trillion synapses in the brain. So we can see the nerve cell on the left passes neurotransmitter onto the cell on the right. This is a synaptic junction. Um, and while we've learned a lot about the biochemical and molecular mechanisms of synaptic transmission over the many decades, the um, discipline of neuroscience itself is really just more than about 100 years old. So although this image looks pretty similar to the one we just saw, it was actually drawn in about 1900. Uh, it's some of the earliest detailed drawings of nerve cells that any human um, ever made. The neuroanatomist uh, who drew this was named Santiago Ramón y Cajal. He is considered by many as the father of modern neuroscience as we know it. So he applied uh, the most current uh, recently developed techniques for staining neurons and for imaging them with microscopes. And he also was a talented artist, so he could go in and do very, very detailed drawings of what he saw. And one of the things that really, really stood out to Cajal is if you look at the nerve cell up here on the right, shooting up out the top of it, it's a tree-like structure that's called a dendrite. It's on the dendrite of the nerve cell that input from other nerve cells talks to it. What struck Cajal was that the dendrites of all the nerve cells that he saw were covered in these structures that we now call dendritic spines, these little protrusions that stick out from the dendrite. Well, he thought this clearly is the basis for memory formation in the brain. It's, it's the connection points between the nerve cells. This is what stores information. And as it turns out, Cajal was exactly correct. But it wasn't until more than 70 years later that it was actually confirmed. So if we zoom in now, and we look at an individual spine of Cajal's. We have cell A and cell B, just like a couple of slides ago. So cell A uh, sends its neurotransmitter to cell B. They communicate with one another. Um, but a couple of research, uh, researchers, Tim Bliss and Terry Lumu, in the laboratory of Perry Anderson, were working in the late 1960s and early 1970s, and they placed stimulating and recording electrodes into the brains of anesthetized rabbits. And what they did was they applied patterned electrical stimulation. They had a well-defined anatomical pathway, and they placed in a tetanus of about 10 to 20 hertz um, and applied this so that cell A persistently drove cell B to fire. And what they found was that uh, even in response to very brief patterns or pulses of electrical stimulation, the strength of the evoked response or the synaptic connection uh, was much, much stronger, uh, and this effect lasted many, many hours. So the jingle that this is known by is cells that fire together, wire together. So in, in light of our previous TED speaker's talk, we know that the statement must be true. Um, but uh, uh, this, the more technical term for this is long-term potentiation, or um, LTP. So one of the most exciting things about Bliss and Lumo's discovery was that it took place in a structure called the hippocampus. So in humans, the hippocampus is about as big around as your pinky finger. It sits in your temporal lobe just in the midline of your ear. And as we'll see in a few slides, indeed, this structure is very, very critical for learning and memory. Uh, the structure is common to all mammals uh, and many other species. It's not just in humans. Um, so shown on the right is an example of the hippocampus in a rodent. Uh, it has a dorsal half and a ventral half. Uh, and it, it's quite good that lower species have a hippocampus for us to study because it's not, it's not very ethical to just take people off the street and you know, stick electrodes in their brains. We can't really do that. Um, so as it turns out, one of the most 
intensely and well understood models for learning and memory is the lowly rodent hippocampus. So uh, just as a case of this, as an example of this, for my own graduate work, I had placed stimulating and recording electrodes in the hippocampi of a freely behaving rats. They were placed in the light side of a two-chambered box with a light side and a dark side. The natural tendency of the rats is to avoid the light and to walk into the dark. They feel safer there. But when the rats went in, they got about a two-second foot shock. It's a mild foot shock. They just got it one time. But based on this one learning episode, the animal would remember uh, for days and weeks to avoid the dark side of the box. So the animal has its own flashbulb type memory going off and it learns to avoid this bad place. What I found was that a subset of the recording electrodes in the animal's hippocampi actually showed increases very similar to what Bliss and Lomo had described more than 30 years before. Uh, and this isn't a very unique study. Um, other other researchers have looked in other brain areas following different types of learning and seen that these types of changes happen all over the brain. If you have the right training paradigm, um, you're probably gonna see plastic-related changes going on as a consequence of learning. If you put in chemicals that prevent synaptic enhancements from happening, oftentimes this blocks memory formation. And this is even crazier, this was done more recently, you could put in drugs that shut down recently enhanced synapses. They knock the synaptic weights back down and the animals actually lose their memory. So a really profound demonstration of how bad it is when you can't make a new memory can be seen with the example of an individual named Clive Waring. He had a case of herpes encephalitis, a virus that ate away his hippocampus completely. He lost both hippocampi on both sides. And he ended up with one of the worst known cases ever of amnesia. He could only make memories that lasted between seven and 30 seconds long. And so shown here is his wife interviewing him about what his life is like when he can't make new memories and he can't recall his past. Because... I have nothing to say about it. It's just like death. Mm. No thoughts of any kind. No dreams, no difference between day and night. No sight, no sound, no taste, no touch, no smell. It's like death. No difference between day and night. No thoughts, nothing. No dreams, nothing at all. How any, question, any question you have is the answer I don't know. Mm. There's nothing to say. Mm. No dreams, no sight, no sound, no taste, no touch, no smell, nothing at all, no thoughts, nothing. Since how long ago? It's years, that's all I know. The whole time I've been ill, nothing at all, no thoughts, nothing. What's it like now? I can see. Mm -hmm. First time. First time I had any evidence I was alive. And do you feel sort of normal now? Yes. Since I sat down here, I don't remember sitting down here. You don't remember sitting down? No, I never see any human being now. I can see you three of you now. No touch, no smell, nothing at all. Do you, do you know what happened to you? No. Any idea? No idea at all. Just like death. Do you know how long you've been on? No this? idea. Just been five years. That's all. When do you? Any idea what year you got ill? No. Have a guess. Sometime in the eighties. Sometime in the eighties. Yes. That's all I Early eighties, mid eighties, late eighties. Oh, guess. Middle eighties. Middle eighties. Yeah. That's correct. Mm. And do you know what year it is now? No. Have a guess. Was in the nineties, I suppose. Yeah, how, how far in would you no, say? No, I don't know. Anything between 91 and 99, I don't know. You've no, no feeling for no, that? No. no. But it's, it's now 1998? Mm -hmm. So I think it's safe to say that he has lost more than the ability just to, for example, uh, learn how to play golf. Uh, he has no sense of identity and no sense of continuity in life. So this is in fact uh, a very central aspect of our being, remembering who we are, what we're about, what we want to do. As it turns out, decades of research have also shown that the very same circuits which mediate memory formation also mediate our sense of self-location and spatial navigation. Um, so the fact is memory and navigation are absolutely inseparable functions in the brain. This is illustrated really nicely by a recently published study where human patients, they were epileptic, they were undergoing brain surgery, their skulls were open, and a very privileged group of researchers were able to go in and place uh, recording electrodes in the hippocampi of these human subjects. And what they had the people do was to navigate around this virtual town 
Uh, you can see there's an apartment building at top, a skyscraper at the bottom. Um, they could explore the environment and they could form a mental map of the place. And then once they had done that, they were tasked with delivering different items to different locations on that map. So the different delivery spots are shown in red on the map. So in this case, the person had to deliver a, a zucchini to the bakery. And after the experiment was over, uh, the subject was asked, uh, what did you deliver to the bakery? The person had to recall, I delivered a zucchini. But the crazy thing is that the cells which were active when the person was around that spatial location also perked up and became more active when he recalled zucchini. So he wasn't trying to recall the spatial location, he was recalling the item. But the spatial content came along for the ride. So it really illustrates the fact that these two things are definitely interconnected. Well, like I've said before, human subjects are pretty hard to come by for doing neurophysiological experiments. So oftentimes we neuroscientists have to rely on animal models. And in fact, most of what we know about the cellular mechanisms for spatial navigation were learned in animal models. So we'll go back to the hippocampus now. We're back in the brain of a rat. Um, a researcher named uh, John O'Keefe had lowered recording electrodes down to the hippocampus of rats. And what he found was a cell type that he called place cells, or place responsive cells. I'm gonna show you a video of one here and now. All I'll say is that anytime you hear the popping sound and see a red dot appear on the screen, that's actually the discharge of an isolated neuron in the animal's brain. So are there any disbelievers now? <laughs> so for, for, for decades, it was thought that uh, place cells were the ultimate spatial code in the brain. Uh, but as it turns out, if you change the walls, uh, the color of the walls in the box, if you change the scents, or the odors, if you add an object or a landmark, the firing rate and the location of the cells will actually change in response to these stimuli. So it's not just a spatial code. It's actually also uh, coding different aspects of the animal's experience within that space, right? So things that actually color the animal's experience in that space. So what we neuroscientists can do is go in and look, for example, on the top right, you see the path of the animal in white and where the cell was firing in red. And down beneath it, you have got a rate map where higher, co hotter colors, uh, the red color corresponds to higher firing rate and the blue color corresponds to the cell not firing at all. So the pattern of the cell that I'm gonna show you next is actually very, very different from this image. So like I said, for decades, place cells were thought as the ultimate spatial code in the brain, but there's all of these other things that can change the way that a place cell fires. Well, Edvard and Maybert Moser came along more than 30 years later, here in Trondheim, actually neuroscience history was made here in Trondheim in 2005. So two researchers in the laboratory of Edvard and Meibert Moser, uh, their names were Torkel Hofting and Marianne Fien, they had lowered recording electrodes into the entorhinal cortex. Now this is a structure that's one synapse upstream from the hippocampus. The hypothesis was that spatial signals aren't generated in the hippocampus, but the actual cortical representation of space is occurring elsewhere out in the brain, and then it gets inherited down to the hippocampus. So I'll show you an example now of the cell type they discovered called a grid cell. All I'll say is that as opposed to the previous video where there was one firing field here, there is a lot of firing fields, and I'll let you guys spot the pattern. Whenever the cell fires, it shows up as a white dot on the screen. Maybe it's started to become clear now. So far more than just an oddity, uh, as it turns out, the discovery of the grid cell represented one of the most profound discoveries um, in this field of research in more than 35 years. 
instead of having lines of latitude and, and longitude that go across a map, say, of Washington, D.C., uh, the brain doesn't opt for squares, it opts for triangles, shown here. So the fundamental unit of the grid map is equilateral triangles. The rat has no idea what an equilateral triangle is, let alone a straight line, but the brain cells in the animal's entorhinal cortex do. And this is absolutely baffling and mysterious, and there's lots of models that are out there uh, that seek to explain how this pattern forms. So it's not just one equilateral triangle. The entire recording environment that's accessible to the animal is tiled with equilateral triangles. Because of the geometric position, the um, triangles add up to make ever bigger triangles. Um, and it's not just in this recording box, it's in any recording box that an animal is placed in. The same pattern is always expressed. So this led to the conclusion that these cells are probably the brain's universal spatial mapping system. So what's constantly ongoing in our own heads is we're forming new memories. Let's say you went to a birthday party, you remember who you saw, what you ate, what you were wearing, if it was fun. Uh, these types of details of that event might be encoded in the hippocampal system, something akin to place cells. Whereas where the house was located in Trondheim, your sense of where you were at the time is being simultaneously recorded by grid cells in your brain. So for every memory that you make, it's like your brain is geotagging it, which is exactly identical to you know, what goes on whenever you post on Twitter uh, that you had been somewhere, and you say where you were, do something similar on Facebook. So I've talked a lot about animal models, mostly about rats, um, but it's worth noting that uh, for every species that researchers have looked in to see if the same cell types exist, they've always found them. They've been found in mice, they've been found in bats, they've been found in monkeys, and then more recently, they've even been shown to exist in humans. So what this implies is that place cells and grid cells, among many other cell types, um, originated at least as far back as the common ancestor of all mammals. So that puts them back at least 100 million years old, and they're probably much older than that. So the place cells and grid cells that I as a researcher would study every day are, are oftentimes you know, older than some of the stones that I might pass uh, while I'm biking on my way to work. And I'll just close by saying, why do we do this type of thing? Why study the cellular mechanisms of memory and navigation? Well, we'll take Alzheimer's disease as an example. So you can see in the healthy brain uh, on the left and the Alzheimer's brain on the right, the cortex is uh, dramatically uh, atrophied in the case of Alzheimer's. Some of the earliest symptoms in Alzheimer's are spatial disorientation and uh, memory loss. But as it turns out, the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex are two of the earliest afflicted structures in Alzheimer's. Right? Actually, the disease starts in the entorhinal cortex and then kind of spreads um, like a disease throughout the rest of the brain. So it's far more than just intellectual curiosity um, because when we study how the brain navigates and forms memories, we can begin to understand uh, what goes wrong in diseases like Alzheimer's disease. And this can help guide the search not only for treatments, but possibly even cures, not only for Alzheimer's disease, but for uh, a wide spectrum of neurological disorders. Thank you very much.